the chat. Yeah. We recorded. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's panel discussion on China. We're going to have a great session for you today, um, and uh, we'll get into some of the intros here in a moment. We'll take care of some housekeeping as people filter in. Nice to see some familiar faces as I scroll down here on the right. Um, hopefully, you are seeing my screen. Yes. Uh, perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, let's let's get into it. So as we, we do with our sessions, um, if you have any um, questions, please send questions to me as it relates to issues with sound or video. Um, also, as we get into it um, for the presentation itself today, we'd love if our panelists could get through their each of their stories and then questions that you may have. You can put them in the chat to me directly, put them in the chat for everyone, um, or when we finish, uh, it would be great to get your questions and jumping in um, from, from you as, as we go. Um, just real quick on IERG for those of you who are visiting, and thank you for joining us. Um, you know, interestingly, today we've got uh, potentially folks from Spain, Germany, and 10 states within the U.S., so we got a good representation, um, at least registered for today. Uh, roughly 50 people had signed up, and we'll be able to catch this recording afterwards if they weren't able to make the session today. Um, but IERG, in, in its essence, is is an international executive resources group for international executives. Many of us have worked over and lived overseas and or from overseas living and working in the U.S. and doing business globally. Um, we, IERG, have chapters uh, across the U.S. Um, if I go east to west, Boston, Connecticut, New York, uh, Florida, uh, Dallas, Chicago, California. Um, and, um, you know, we've got members across um, both uh, North America, the American, well, South America, um, a couple in Europe and in Asia as well. Um, but the majority of our folks are folks residing uh, in in the U.S. So welcome everyone today. Um, let's let's dive in. So first, welcoming our panelists. Um, interestingly, today for those of you who who are keeping track, there are four people from Thunderbird, the Global School of Management. Um, and first up is Alan Morrison. And he's a professor at Thunderbird, previously served as CEO and director general, um, as well as uh, heavily involved in Arizona State University and the international management community. He is a prolific writer, um, having authored over 60 articles and 13 books. He literally wrote the book on international management. And also today he'll be speaking with us uh, about his book here, you can see The China Enterprise. So welcome to you, Alan. Uh, also, we've got Lawrence Allen, um, who joins us from Hydric and Struggles, also a T-Bird, um, entrepreneur, another writer here, um, and um, importantly for today's conversation, spent quite a bit of time uh, in uh, Greater China, over 20 years in multiple roles, um, as you can see here, Managing Director for Asia Pacific, Regional Director of Operations Far East, Country Business Manager for China for companies such as Nestle, Hershey, and Warner Lambert. Um, he'll be chatting with us today about his experience with the Chocolate Fortunes, the battle for the hearts, minds, and taste buds of China's consumers. We also have Stephen Sang, who is owner and founder of D-Miner Studio. Uh, Stephen comes to us from Taiwan, having spent time in China, and now resides in upstate New York. And he'll be speaking with us around digital marketing, how to enter into the Chinese market, but also how Chinese companies are looking to get into places like the US, all, all as it relates to going to market digitally. Um, he also is a writer managing a newsletter uh, where he extols his various interests, including digital marketing. And I've been um, lucky enough to follow his, his newsletter for a while now and enjoy, uh, enjoy the musings. Uh, I'm Sean Patrick. Um, you know, I am not a writer, but I do have um, a credit for a book design from Thunderbird professor Dick Mahoney, which you can see here, Petalos, which is a book uh, of bilingual poetry that I helped create uh, the mechanism for which it was, well, which it is read by, by its viewers. So not a writer, but I'll get some design in and I get a book credit while I'm at it. Anyway, looking forward to today's session. Let's dive in. Uh, first up, Alan, can you take it away with the challenges of competing in and with China? 
Yeah, thank you. It's good to meet you all. Uh, we've got a, a great uh, group of folks that uh, will be talking about the challenges of competing in and with China. Um, this is uh, really the centerpiece of, uh, of the book that I just finished publishing called Enterprise China, and uh, I'm excited about the book. My co-author my co is a professor at INSEAD, and uh, depending on the time, this is the number one selling book in different categories in, in Amazon, so very excited about it. It involves a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of interviews, a lot of thinking, uh, a lot of testing out ideas, and so on. But for this audience, uh, let, let me let me just uh, pose two questions that I, I, at least I wanted to to uh, spend a bit of time addressing. And of course, the book goes into each of these uh, topics in much greater detail. So it just uh, scratched the surface on this. But um, the first question as you're thinking about China is why are you interested in China? That, that, that this um, this sounds like a, a kind of weak question, but in fact. Uh, most companies are not necessarily clear in terms of why they're interested in China. And the second is, uh, wh what are you up against? Uh, my focus is less about the geopolitics and more about how companies in China are competing, whether they're Chinese companies or foreign companies. So it's on the enterprise level, not on geopolitics, although we do talk about policy a fair bit. Uh, let's go ahead to the next uh, next slide. So why are you interested in China? Um, we, we tend to see companies that are interested in upstream activities. So they're interested in China as a base for supply. We also see companies that are interested in China because it's in some industries the world's largest market. If it's not the world's largest, it typically is the world's second largest market, whether you're dealing with uh, airplanes or semiconductors or what have you not. They are a huge, huge market. If you look at these two continuums, we identify four kinds of companies in terms of their interests and their area of focus in China. We have what are called below the radar players who are kind of dabbling in China. Uh, we have companies that are leverage players that focus leveraging the competitive advantage of China as a platform. We see market players who are focused on that Chinese market. And we do see a, a, a slew of what we call dual mar or dual players Recognize that firms with uh, you know few upstream and downstream uh, activities in China, and there are over a million of these firms, they face very, very uh, different challenges than the dual players up in the top end right. So when you talk about why are you interested in China, uh, what is your kind of overall focus on China, uh, it has a huge impact on how the Chinese market will either uh, uh, bite back or will be a, 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 a tailwind as your uh, company advances. Uh, let's take a look at the, the, ne the next slide and we're gonna look at the risks and challenges for, for each of those groups. The below the radar players, and as I mentioned, there are over a million of these companies, the majority of Western companies or foreign companies doing business in China are in fact below the radar players. They are at high risk as we look, at, look to the future of being completely overwhelmed by what I call enterprise China. We'll talk about that in the next slide. What is this enterprise China? But these companies, my, my prediction is, are going to have a very hard future ahead of themselves. Market players, these are companies like Rolex, KFC, and so on. Uh, the, these are companies that are interested in China uh, because of the market. They're often uh, products which um, are not customized for the local market in targeted in, in industries targeted by the Chinese. Uh, these, these companies also face considerable headwinds. Other companies in non-targeted industries that are focused on the Chinese market, um, we, we do not anticipate huge problems for them or a different type of problem for them than we've seen over the past uh, number of decades. The upstream players, these are the these are companies that are using China as a platform for their manufacturing. You know the the, the manufacture of the world. These companies are at great risk of uh, supply chain interruptions through trade frictions, uh, et cetera, uh, and many of them are facing uh, additional challenges as they pursue this China plus one strategy. And then there are dual players, companies like Apple, Boeing, Nike, and so on. Um, these companies are are are. Um, at great risk, particularly if they're in these targeted industries, which, which I'll address in a minute. Um, 
the solution for many of these companies is increasingly a in China for China strategy, which creates some disruptions for their global uh, competitiveness. Um, so each of these strategies has opportunities, has threats, and and they're quite different, quite distinct as we look to China over the next uh, 10 years or so. Uh, let's go down to the next slide if we can. What is Enterprise China? I mentioned that, and it's the title of my book. Uh, it, it's important as you think about China and competing with, uh, in and with China that we understand this concept of Enterprise China. It is this multi-trillion dollar monolith. It includes the government, it includes uh, state-owned enterprises, it includes privately owned enterprises, and almost more important than any of that, impenetrable ecosystems that reside in China. Our research found that virtually every medium to large company has some level of direct or indirect state control. Um, whether it's through ownership or not, state control is significant in China. Even when the government doesn't own a privately owned enterprises, they exert uh, often tremendous influence uh, through minority ownership positions. We found it almost impossible in our research to find even privately owned enterprises that did not have some affiliation, some ownership position, 4%, 8%, 2%, from one of the uh, the governments. Uh, also through regulations and administrative guidance. Um, for example, all companies in China that have more than 50 employees must have an office of the CCP and must have an office for, with, for a representative secretary. The state directs uh, uh, things such as who they can partner with, how they access funding, network membership, ecosystem membership, uh, permits for international trade, who serves on their boards, whether and how they list their shares, and on and on and on. So it's this notion of the what we call the enterprise China, how that market works, how the system works, fundamentally different. It's important for Western firms to understand that as they work in China, but also as they think about Chinese uh, coming after them in their home markets. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. I mentioned before targeted industries. This is something foreign uh, leaders need to better understand. The Chinese have identified 15 different industries. Uh, here, here's a list of them, and some of the industries can be then sub, further subdivided. These are targeted industries, very consistent with the fourth industri industrial revolution. We can all understand why they may be targeted. But if you are in these industries, the government, the Chinese government has already told you that they will dominate that industry domestically. In some cases, 70% market share is mandated. In other cases, 80 and even 90% domestic market share. So if you are, uh, if you're Tesla, you know that the Chinese will, will control over 80% of the market share in China. Uh, it's a matter of them clawing that forward. And by next year, that, that, that will be the case and it will advance from there. If you are in a targeted industry, you are your your future is highly restricted. Um, let's go on, uh, Sean. The next slide. So, uh, keys to competing with uh, with the Chinese. Um, first off, a, a key element of China's strategy is to go out and win globally. So they they have a three stage strategy. They want to they want to dominate domestically, and ultimately they want to go out and win globally. They want to flip the dependency relationships of the West. The rest of the world is dependent on China. And they do this through a number of different means, through acquisitions, through piggybacking on government support, uh, setting standards. And so even if you're an American company or an Argentinian company or a French company, the the enterprise China is is there certainly in the background in China, but in the foreground, increasingly in your home market. Uh, they, is, in many cases, uh, they are there and you don't, you don't realize they're there because of their brands, because of how they set up their operations. So as you think about competing in and with China, uh, question number one is, uh, how exposed are you to enterprise China? And to what degree is your company at risk of being disrupted by what is happening in China or by what enterprise China is doing in your home market. So 
uh, step one, let's understand why you're interested in China. Step number two is even if you're not in China, let's try to better understand how exposed you are to enterprise China. So let's uh, talk about some recommendations. And we have chapters in the book that go through this. I just want to uh, emphasize a few points at, the, at this stage. And one is the importance of having options, investing in options. Uh, China is a huge market. It's a critical strategic supplier. You, we need options for the future. None of us can fully predict what will happen. And so as you think about options, take a long-term perspective. Uh, it takes time. It takes management bandwidth. It takes energy. It takes money to build options that diversify your risk away from China. Few companies you know, can afford to not have ch uh, options vis-a-vis -vis China. So a big discussion can and should be had about the importance of hedging your bets and having investing in options. The second set of recommendations is, um, uh, go ahead, Stephen, we'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the next slide, is the importance of if you are in China, uh, uh, strengthening your China-centric sec leadership competencies. Western companies have done a poor job building the next generations of leaders in China for their Chinese operations. And furthermore, they've done a poor job, even if they're not in China, uh, including Chinese representation in their senior committees and their senior teams of management. We need to far better understand what's going on in China. And Westerners, even as educated as they are, as experienced as they are, will never be insiders in China. And so may, ultimately, it's a leadership challenge that Western companies face, whether in or outside of China. Let's really focus on uh, and creating a, uh, a cadre of, of loyal senior managers who are China, not just experts, who are Chinese and insiders in China. Uh, I, my final comment, I think this is the last slide I, I'm going to have, and we have some great uh, presentations on the panel. So do you want to um, go ahead, uh, Sean, with the next slide? And that is, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about is China past its peak and in decline? So this is just a, uh, uh, a snapshot of a very recent Washington, or a Wall Street Journal article. Um, there is evidence, in fact, and maybe this will come up in the Q&A session, there is evidence that China has passed its peak and is maybe in, in decline for demographic reasons, political reasons, and so on. Just a couple of examples of this. And when we look at the Fortune 5, the Global uh, 500, uh, in 2020, uh, uh, China surpassed the United States in terms of the number of multinational companies on that list. Uh, in 2023, just a few years later, the U.S. has now surpassed China. Uh, in terms of growth, American companies, this is over the past three years, are growing faster than Chinese companies. And our profits are growing faster than Chinese companies. In 2023, the average profit of uh, multi American multinational companies in the Fortune 500 list, 8.4%. The average profits for Chinese firms on the Fortune Global 500 list, 4.7. So American companies are almost twice as profitable and are growing faster than Chinese companies. Again, this is big companies only. Having said that, uh, China is still growing. Their numbers of uh, companies are still increasing in terms of big companies. And despite them uh, shadowing the U.S., Singapore, and so on in terms of profitability, they are still more profitable than German companies. And they're still more profitable than French companies. And they still have about twice the level of profit margins as Indian companies. So even though there is evidence that they've reached their peak and maybe slowly sliding into decline, and I think they are compared to the U.S. at a disadvantage. But compared to the rest of the world, they're not in such bad condition. So let's let's recognize China as a huge opportunity. Uh, we ought to recognize the power of this enterprise uh, China model. And, uh, and let's, I think, hopefully be wiser about how we think about China going forward. Thanks, Sean. Maybe we'll have some questions later, but let's go ahead and listen to our other great presenters. Hello, everyone. My name Lawrence Allen. I spent 22 years in China working for Nestle, Hershey, and other companies. So um, in 2010, I wrote a book called Chocolate Fortunes, The Battle for the Hearts, Minds, and Taste Buds of China's Consumers. So 
Today, we're going to be the blind man touching a very different part of the elephant, uh, a part that Enterprise China really didn't care about. Chocolate is not a strategic product. Also, there were and still are de facto no real local Chinese companies to compete with. So it was a bit of an ideal whiteboard where uh, in 1978, you had a billion people who'd never seen, heard, tasted, or touched chocolate. Although I've been admonished by grannies who said, oh, when I was a little girl in Shanghai in the colonial era, uh, areas, I had Cadbury. Well, okay, that's the 0.001%. So effectively, and not just for chocolate, for all pro Western products, we had an absolutely clean slate in the 1980s of consumers who had their arms open, what is chocolate? Teach me. I want to learn. I want to indulge. So next slide, please. So as we look at China in 78, uh, those of you who don't know, uh, China was emerging from 30 years of near total isolation, not just from products, but from people in the world. Uh, chocolate was a totally foreign product. It really is today. There's no traditional history of chocolate in the Chinese palate or cuisine among the four tastes or the eight cuisines across China. It just doesn't exist or didn't exist, such as in Mesoamerica or Europe. Uh, certainly at the time in the 80s, uh, brands were completely, uh, consumers were completely unaware of brands and no consumers had any experience. So this was an interesting scenario. Uh, Russia, another Chinese, or another communist country, had Red October. Uh, also, brands that came in from Europe, across Africa, uh, Latin America, chocolate was ubiquitous around the world. But here was a part of the world, one fifth of the population, who never tasted chocolate. So this was a crucible where we mixed uh, new product, new new brands, five major players, and we'll talk about and uh, see what happens. Right. So next slide, please. So what were the chocolate industry's challenge, right? So how do you understand the consumer's wants and needs and expectations when you really can't communicate with them? Uh, there was no Nielsen. There was no uh, depth of any data about consumers. And so the first thing that companies would do in the early days was to do focus groups. Uh, what better way to listen to consumers uh, but still, it was very difficult to get a, an idea of what Chinese consumers wanted. But this was a universal challenge across Hershey, Cadbury, Mars, Ferrero, and Nestle. Uh, everybody was in the same boat. Uh, we were flying quite blind. Um, secondly, well, how do you establish a culinary and cultural bridge for a high indulgence confection like chocolate with consumers whose palates are trained to dr dried fish, rice, noodles, and maybe meat as a garnish, right? Um, how else do you navigate the complexities and ambiguities of an emerging China? Um, what was China in the early days, 80s, early 90s? Um, what was legal? What was illegal? Could you get your money out once you put it in? Uh, you couldn't even use renminbi, the Chinese currency, until the late 80s, you, you were stuck with foreign exchange certificates and maybe sales inside of state-run uh, friendship stores and that sort of thing. So it was quite a complex environment, but that created an opportunity. We were all in a, had, had a level playing field. Everybody had the same disadvantage, but everyone also had the same advantage. Uh, foreign companies had prestige and credibility, whether earned or not, it was automatic. Right. While you're a foreign company, you're selling this foreign confection. Every one of us had that same instant credibility and prestige to lose or to win with. Um, there are no real financial barriers. Nobody was throwing up factories in China to make chocolate in the 80s. Uh, that really came in the early 90s, first half of the 90s, really. Uh, and the regulatory barriers were quite low. Duties were 12%. So you could effectively export your way to market share in China without having to build infrastructure. As I mentioned earlier, we were all flying blind. We didn't have scan track data. There were companies, my predecessor, who built the model for Hershey's entry into China. He would 
stand people with a clipboard in chocolate aisles and supermarkets and and stores and tick off how what the sales were uh, in those stores in a particular day and then extrapolate that to number of stores and estimate volumes and market size city to city, um, which was a really an effective way of doing it. It worked, uh, it, but uh, we didn't have to pay Nielsen either, which was nice. And that's what we really did. Fle we flew by the seat of our pants, uh, filling gaps, making things happen. And lastly, no local competition, really. Um, I'll talk a little bit about another company, LeConte, which is a um, China oils, foodstuffs corporation, big food conglomerate in China had started up, but it really was not a significant player. So the big question and the big opportunity was who's going to establish the taste profile for their chocolate with a billion consumers? Um, chocolate is is a very, it's almost like cigarettes in that people will smoke the same brand of cigarettes for 25 years. Uh, people consume the same chocolate the same way. So that taste profile, that preference uh, was wide open to be won or lost. Next slide, please, Sean. So who were these players? Um, each of them came to the, to the battlefield with their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, the accidental hero of the, the story is Ferrero. Um, they were Nutella, they were Tic Tac, and they were a newcomer to chocolate. Ferrara Rocher was invented in 1982. Uh, but lo and behold, overpackaged, covered with gold, looking like something of great value. Uh, it was a huge hit with the Chinese consumers, be them in Singapore, Hong Kong, or China. And actually, interestingly enough, that was the first impression for a lot of Chinese people about what chocolate was because you stacked it high and watched it fly in stores in Hong Kong and were brought was brought into China during the Chinese New Year and other festivals as gifts. Uh, so that was a first impression for many Chinese. Um, Hershey, the great American chocolate bar, uh, there were very limited international experience, about 15% of their sales outside of North America. Not too different today. So they weren't really a big player in international, very strong in U.S. domestic business. Uh, even Europe, they'd gone into a couple of joint ventures, building operations, but they buying up companies and hardware, but really didn't succeed in the soft side of the business, building their brand with consumers and stinging from that. They went to China saying, OK, we're not going to build factories here or operations, let's start building the business with consumers. Nestle, um, by many measures at the time, the largest chocolate company in the world through acquisitions and multiple brands, this global titan of food worldwide, um, they had big fish to fry in China, coffee. Uh, Nestle taught the Chinese consumer how to drink coffee through their Nescafe one plus two sachet. That's about the only chocolate uh, coffee you could get at, at certain times, they had a nutritional mission to unlock uh, in, uh, infant formula and desiccated uh, milk products to improve the nutrition of China with the government's support and encouragement. So chocolate really wasn't a big priority for them. They played in the game. Uh, as Alan said, they're, they're a minor player uh, with Kit Kat and some others, but that, that they weren't interested so much in the chocolate market. Mars definitely was. Mars was it to say the great American candy bar company. They made candy bars, Milky Way, uh, uh, Snickers, M&Ms. This chocolate is part of a, a, a in, in, enrobing the product, but not chocolate bars per se until they bought Dove, which was a recent acquisition. Uh, Mid eighties bought the Dove brand, which was ice cream and said, Hey, this chocolate's really good. Let's launch a chocolate bar. So they were actually brand new to pure and ingredientated chocolate. And then, of course, Cadbury. Certainly, they would be the winner. The sun never set on the Cadbury empire. Australia to Latin America to Africa, Asia, India, right? Cadbury was the world's standard for chocolate. Surely, that would have given them the ability to be number one in China. Next slide, please. So how did that play out with the Chinese consumer? Oh, okay, so you have the four grandparents that call the inverted uh, pyramid, who again, whose palates were trained to rice, noodles, fish, 
uh, meat as a garnish. You had two parents uh, of the little emperors uh, who were more, their palates were more developed. Maybe they'd been on a holiday in Hong Kong or a business trip to Singapore. They were able to tolerate chocolate a little more and, and you would see patterns, consumption patterns, very different than ours. For example, a young lady in the office would take a 60 gram bar of chocolate and take one bite, put a new, use a paper clip to uh, wrap it up. And the next day come in and take another bite. And she may take three days to finish that chocolate bar because they didn't sit down and eat massive amounts of, of chocolate. But Hershey's Kisses were actually perfect for sharing, right? Little 11 gram piece. And so with Hershey's, they took off. So what I'm getting at is this market was very dynamic. You had to think your way through it every single day. Um, you also had a China that was evolving um, into a, a little, uh, for us, a little emperor society. They were very important to our business plan. Uh, they had, they controlled the spending power of four adult, uh, five adults, six adults, uh, depending on the family. Uh, and they had pester power. So it really played a great role in how chocolate became now a significant part of the snacking and snack foods business in China. Um, there are many players today. I I'm not going to give away who, who won the chocolate war. It's still to a large effect going on. You're going to have to read my book, Chocolate Fortunes. But <laughs> what were the key success factors um, just to summarize here, and I think the the number one factor uh, for success in China had to be those companies that were committed to the market, that were not looking for three and two year, five year even ROI, but realized this is going to be a long haul. It wasn't the ones who were in earliest either. It was it, you know there were the ones that some of the ones that were in earliest were the ones that failed earliest, right? Um, secondly. It's the companies that listen to the consumer. And I'm going to give one example and wrap up here. So the first real chocolate story in China was with Mars, who advertised and promoted at the 1990 Asian Games, which were held in Beijing. It was going to, hey, melt in your mouth, not in your hand, right? So M&Ms is perfect for China because they don't have refrigerated supply chain and so forth. But guess what? The Chinese consumer looked at that and said, that's that's kids candy. You know, we saw Ferrero. We want high indulgence. Impress us. And so uh, Mike Blackburn, who was the expat running uh, Mars business at that time, said to headquarters, stop sending me Snickers. I don't want Snickers. I don't want M&Ms. I want Dove. And he got a lot of resistance and said, well, hey, Dove is brand new. It's high indulgence. Chinese consumers don't even understand chocolate. Why would you send them the best? And Mike said, because that's what they want. And I will give you one thing uh, from, from the story. 40% of chocolate products sold in China today are a, a Mars product, mostly Dove. So put the consumer first, have a long-term commitment to the market. And uh, that's what works in China. Great. It's a great read. It's a great read. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Lawrence. Stephen. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks for Alan's and Lawrence's presentations. Um, just to follow up on their presentations, Enterprise China is pushing hard overseas right now because one of my clients is a stay-on company in China. I'm doing digital marketing for them to enter the European and the US markets. So I know they really want to expand from the Chinese market to European markets. And also every time I travel back to China, I always bring chocolates. I can tell my <laughs> friends, <laughs> my friends and my clients is still, they still like chocolate. So it's a side note related to both of their presentations. All right, so I will talk about digital marketing in China here. Uh, let's step into the first slide, Sean. All right, so here I will talk about Greater China Internet Landscape. Why Greater China? Because a lot of my clients are still confused about the uh, internet landscape uh, in Greater China. Some of them still think they all have the same internet landscape. Uh, actually, they don't have the same internet landscape. Uh, by definition, uh, Greater China includes mainland China, Taiwan, Macau, 
uh, Hong Kong. In China, um, actually, we mean made in China. So for Taiwan, uh, they use the line, it's an instant messenger, also popular in Japan, and then Facebook, Google. For Hong Kong, they use WhatsApp, Facebook, Google. And then Macau, WeChat, Facebook, Google. And uh, China, because of the China firewall, almost all the internet services um, are not working in China, including Facebook, Twitter, Google, Snapchat, Instagram, LinkedIn, all you can think of are not working in China. So that's why China has its own internet ecosystem. For search engine, China has Baidu. For instant messenger, WeChat. For uh, Twitter, in China, they have uh, Weibo. So um, the China has its unique in internet ecosystem. And also in terms of written language, China mainly uses simplified Chinese characters. For Taiwan, Macau, Hong Kong, they mainly uses traditional Chinese characters. Why I mention this here? Because for digital marketing, if you want to target a right audience in the right area, you have to use the right written language to target them. Otherwise, it's hard to target them. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I will talk about China internet regulation here. Disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, so all I'm sure is just a personal and a big experience. Uh, I don't like to talk about this, but my lawyer in the US always suggests me to talk about this in public presentation. All right, so first one is the internet content provider license, ICP. So it's a license you need for hosting a website in China. If you don't have this license, you can, not host your website. Your website cannot go live, no exception. And the second one, if you are running certain business categories online, you need a special license. For example, if you are running Amazon like a marketplace service or CDN content delivery network service, you need to apply for a special license. And also there's a, a new law called a China Personal Information Protection Law, PIPL. It's like a GPDR in China. And it's a very new law. They just launched this law in 2021. Um, so there's uh, one section, especially related to uh, uh, foreign companies. This section says, um, if you collect personal information in China and you want to transfer the information overseas, you have to either um, use the official template issued by Chinese government to sign with the party who received the uh, data overseas, or you have to pass the security audit by government, or you have to apply for special license. Um, you have to follow the, the one of the uh, three criteria. So it means for foreign companies, you have to follow the regulation to transfer data. Otherwise, you cannot transfer data. Uh, of course, it's still a new law. A lot of uh, area are not uh, clear. Um, a lot of my clients uh, are still observing, but um, PIPL is certainly an um, um, area of foreign companies to uh, pay attention to. And also, if you if you want to host a website or use the online service, online ad service in China, you need to have the uh, China business license. Of course, there's work from there. If you are a foreign company um, who entered China in early stage, you can always uh, use a third party license. Uh, to uh, host your website or use your online service. All right, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's talk about uh, online user behavior in China. Mobile first, China has been a mobile first uh, for a long time. It's actually much, much sooner than most countries. So everyone uses a mobile uh, all the time. And also in China, uh, I'm talking about the uh, uh, consumer case for a daily life context, people really use text message or email. So probably you now you are thinking what they use to communicate. The answer is WeChat. Uh, I will talk about WeChat later. And the lay in terms of a payment, people use uh, Alipay and the WeChat to pay online and offline. I remember I uh, I was in Shanghai earlier this year. I put a lot of cash. And uh, in the end, I didn't spend any of my cash because I always use uh, WeChat or Alipay to pay uh, online or offline. So if you are in China, you show cash to pay. People will realize that you are not from China. Yeah, because you pay cash. Okay. So also um, people receive most information from WeChat. Uh, WeChat is like a, a super app. Uh, 
uh, it's more than instant message messenger. Uh, you can do a lot of things with in WeChat. You can uh, text, you can call, you can share information on the WeChat social network, and you can buy things. And then you, you can even have a webinar there. So it's a powerful uh, mobile app. And also in terms of uh, online, be online user behavior principle, in China, people value convenience rather than privacy. They always think of convenience first, uh, privacy second. It's a different from uh, most of Western countries. So uh, for foreign companies, if they develop any uh, web application or mobile app, then you will find a balance. Because if they just focus on privacy, probably they will make an app that's convenient. That's uh, uh, online user behavior principle here. And also uh, in China, people mix personal and the professional life together uh, because they use WeChat. So it's actually an advantage for the business uh, layer because if you want to communicate with your clients or potential clients, it's very straightforward. You just need to use WeChat because people use WeChat several times a day. It's not like uh, emails or text message. People will not miss it. So um, it's actually better for business to to uh, communicate with clients in China. And also in terms of UI, UI design, uh, you can see the photo on the right. Um, in terms of the UI design, Chinese people prefer a lot of a lot of information on the same page. Why? Because it's easier to find the information you want. Remember, convenience first. It's convenient for them. They don't have to click all the time. So it's about the online user behavior in China. All right, next slide. Okay, so I will talk about the uh, uh, digital marketing challenge for uh, SME foreign companies to enter China. The first one is a strict internet regulation um, because China has more uh, strict and the complex regulation is a challenge for foreign companies uh, to uh, follow. And also China has its whole internet ecosystem. Um, so the foreign companies need to learn the whole new ecosystem. And uh, um, China has a more fragmented and limited online data collection uh, because Baidu is not as, as transparent as Google. So it's hard to collect the data in China. And uh, for foreign companies, uh, sometimes they don't have uh, enough localized uh, online content. They just think they can just have uh, one or two Chinese web pages with uh, most English pages. Actually, it's not uh, good for digital marketing because in China, people still read uh, simplified Chinese uh, characters, and also it's not a good for digital marketing. Then uh, different online user behaviors, China has uh, uh, specific user behaviors. Uh, for foreign companies, they need to, to modify their digital marketing strategy to fit the local user behaviors. Then uh, for digital marketing strategy, uh, some of my clients, they always want to just duplicate their home country digital marketing strategy to China, but for, works in other countries will not work in China. They need to modify their digital marketing strategy to feed uh, the Chinese market. Then the uh, uh, online system and the tools from the headquarters sometimes cannot work smoothly. For example, Hotspot, Salesforce, you have to modify Hotspot and the Salesforce to feed local market. So that's the, uh, another challenge for SME foreign companies. All right, next slide. All right. So um, here is effective B2B China digital marketing channels. Um, it's different from B2C. So in B2B digital marketing, there are two main goals. The one is uh, brand awareness. The second one is the lead generation, sales leads. Um, for the uh, uh, foreign companies who just enter the uh, Chinese market, normally we suggest uh, we have, they should focus on sales leads first because uh, sales leads is equal to opportunity to grow. You need to grow first, then you can move your business forward. Um, then on this chart, you can see there's a B2B website. For B2B digital marketing, website is still important because you are selling specific service or solution to solve specific problem. People will still check your information online. So a good website with a good content is still crucial. Then in terms of channels, you can use uh, Baidu search engine optimization in the Baidu. Uh, paper leak. It's like Google Ads to uh, select the right traffic to your website. Then you can use uh, online webinar. Online webinar is still working in China because you have 
uh, professional uh, knowledge to communicate with your potential clients. Also online PR, people will check your information online. If you have uh, some group PR information there, it will help your credibility. And uh, for the WeChat marketing, WeChat is more for uh, customer nurture and uh, customer communication. So in WeChat, it's like a platform. Uh, you can publish your information through your WeChat business account. Then you can even have the customer service in your business WeChat, and then you can communicate with your potential or current clients. And the LinkedIn outreach, it's like an honorable mention to me. Why? Because if your audience is in China is active on LinkedIn, uh, actually you still can communicate with them on LinkedIn. So all the short-term goals is sales list. Then after you generate sales list, you can pass them to sales team to follow up. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the other way around. I also help a chance clients to go overseas. They do have some challenges. I um the first one is that they don't understand internet ecosystem outside China. Uh, they are just familiar with WeChat, Baidu. They don't understand Facebook, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Telegram, uh, a lot of uh, news uh, channels. So it's hard for them to do digital marketing. And also they are not familiar with the business communication channel outside China. Suddenly they cannot use WeChat to communicate with other people. They have to learn how to use email to communicate, uh, how to send a meeting invite, book a time. It's all new for them. They also have to learn again. And also they are not familiar with the uh, fragmented online channels, meaning there are more channels outside China. Now you have to you have to learn a lot of new channels. It's also challenging for them. And the different user behaviors. In the most countries, um, people separate professional life from a personal life. They have to identify um, the different user behaviors and uh, to have a new digital marketing strategy. And also they realize they have too much data to analyze. They don't know where to start. And uh, uh, the last challenge, um, they don't understand online tools system outside China. What works in China now might not work here outside China. So it's another challenge for them. All right, so uh, it's my uh, presentation. Back to Sean. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, thank you, um, <laughs> guys, for, for a great presentation. We we learned about Enterprise China and considerations for entering the market. We heard about a wide open category, brand new to China and Tabula Rasa. And then also just now going to market, what it takes, what's entailed. Um, you know, thank you guys for, for your time. Uh, anyone interested in connecting with Alan, Lawrence, or Stephen, information is here. Uh, you've got books, you've got websites, newsletters, you name it. Uh, you know, but uh, importantly, as we open the channel for questions, we got about a little less than 10 minutes, but we have some time. Um, does anybody have any questions they want to ping? I haven't seen anything in the chat. Let's see. I, we got I have, uh, this is Richard Guha. I have one question, um, which, you know, anyone can answer. Uh, you know, there's obviously one of the things which is the 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 sort of uh, thing uh, fairly salient is the risk of China invading Taiwan, whether it does or not, who knows. Um, but one of the things, the conventional wisdom says, oh my gosh, you're in real trouble if that happens. But interestingly enough, since Russia invaded Ukraine, a number of companies, including actually Pepsi and Mars, um, have actually doubled down in Russia because they're depending on Russia for a market rather than production for export. And it strikes me that it is possible that even if China were to do um, something uh, with, with Taiwan, it is possible that if you are a company which is using, because even if there are sanctions that may affect you if you're using China for supply, although China's moving a lot of that stuff out of China. But if you are using it as a market, you know, I know, for example, Mercedes Benz has like 37% of its revenues are in China. Same with a lot of companies uh, these days. It is possible that you may be just fine. So I'd love a, a, any opinion on that. Uh, maybe I'll weigh in on that. Uh, it, it's a great question. It's something that's very topical today. Uh, look, a couple of takes on this. 
the first is it's it's very difficult to predict the ripples that will come out of a conflict uh, between China and Taiwan. Uh, for example, what what role will the U.S. military play? Would the conflict escalate? Would the war with Taiwan lead to the destruction of the island's uh, tech facilities? Uh, what would happen in terms of blockades with China? Uh, would it impact the trade routes through the South China Sea? We, we, we don't know. But the notion that it will be a quick and easy and uh, maybe we'll have a few years of punitive sanctions on China, uh, I think is incredibly um, uh, short-sighted. Um, in a Taiwan conflict, foreign investors are very likely to dump their holdings of Chinese securities uh, over a trillion dollars uh, in foreign uh, Chinese bonds and equities, uh, it would lead, I think, to significant decoupling, further decoupling. McKinsey estimates this at between 22 and 37 trillion dollars in economic uh, decline in the case of a full decoupling with China. Um, China is now 90 percent dependent on semi uh, on foreign sem uh, provided uh, produced semiconductors. Taiwan is its largest supplier. It is 100% dependent on advanced semiconductors. And uh, it, it's estimated to be about four generations behind. Um, so what are, the, what are the, the ripple effects? I think they are profound to the point, I think a significant uh, war, uh, my personal belief would not just lead to a severe recession, but risks putting the world in a depressionary state not just based simply on the facts of the war, but just based on the mentality that we are all expecting something big. No one knows what that is, but given the state of the global deficits, uh, I, I think there is a risk of this uh, trigger being pulled, and we are all in very, very uh, serious straits. One thing to add to Alan's comment is I think comparing Russia to China, Russia's invasion right. to China, is is uh, really not going to give us much of a crystal ball. Reason being, uh, China, whereas you pointed out, Russia's of interest to multinational companies as a market, uh, China's of interest for supply chain, right? For basic supply chain. So that's a very different thing. Also, the Chinese economy is massive and Russia's is tiny. So I think the, right. to draw any conclusions between the two, uh, using one or the other is, is not going to get us uh, where we want to be. Uh, just real quick, you know, what what is um, BMW going to be doing with its cars when it can't get any uh, microprocessors or advanced semiconductors? What, what I mean, what happens to, to them in, in, in China and all of the a whole host of companies? If it, it, a th one Thunderbird grad who I met is actually the head of Hormel in China, you know, the guys who make spam, he's not worried, nor <laughs> should he be worried. <laughs> But 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 you know you'll still be selling spam in China. But if you are dealing with any advanced technologies that require trade, uh, you know, amen to the future of those businesses for quite a while till this all gets sorted out. So the ripples I, I think are unimaginable and and quite frankly uh, um, uh, devastating. A uh, couple more down down this path um, as it relates to the banking system. Um, over the years, is, is there a, an improvement that can instill confidence in investors looking to expand or open shop in China? I'm not sure if that's Alan, maybe maybe Lawrence or Steven. Yeah, a little out of my, my area of it. <laughs> so, you know, the, the uh, Western financial institutions have been at one level given a green light to operate in China. The, the Chinese regulators have basically said they will open the door and we've had a whole host of u.s financial institutions uh kicking the tires and making some significant investments uh, they have not thus far done well in china they found there's uh resistance from uh, uh companies western companies which is their primary audience but also chinese companies um they they have had a, a essentially impossible time penetrating the financial ecosystems in China. Uh, and it's not just regulatory, it's just behavioral and it's how the, how the relationships work. 
uh, in financial institutions. So the cost of setting up their own distribution and maintenance and service and so on has been prohibitive. They, they are not doing well in China, uh, irrespective of uh, you know the so-called invitations of the Chinese authorities to welcome foreign investors. Um, so I, I, I think we're still early days in terms of where that, uh, how that story plays out. All right. Question for Stephen. Um, given Elon Musk is talking about creating a WeChat for the U.S., any reason China hasn't expanded WeChat here? Um, using WeChat a lot, um, having lived in Asia, but haven't seen, um, they're not letting new users enroll in the U.S. Any thoughts there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I receive the same question all the time. Um, because a lot of people in the U.S. use the WeChat, they think it's very convenient. Um, but there are two aspects uh, we should look into it. And the first of all, um, China Tencent is a, is a company who owns WeChat. They do try to promote WeChat, that's in the US. But uh, for the mass market, um, it doesn't really fit um, the user behavior. For example, you have to put everything together and it's, a, it's not really the preference for uh, um, the user here in terms of privacy. And also there is a political uh, situation here, you know, because WeChat is from China and uh, people might sense, you know, it's a Chinese product. They are not willing to use it. Um, so WeChat is still popular in China, but only in uh, Chinese people. Um, that's why it's hard to go to the mainstream uh, because in terms of uh, user behavior, it doesn't really fit the normal user user behavior in the US. And also if you consider China uh, impact there, a lot of people might not be willing to use it because they are afraid of you know, privacy or data you know, issues. Yeah, that would be my thought. All right, well, I appreciate we're, we're at time. We have one more question. Um, uh, and I guess, Alan, for you um, and maybe the others, leaving aside the issue of whether China is post-peak or not, um, what would the effect of an envisioned real estate crash can China have on enterprise China? Um, I know this came up with Gina Raimundo, um, who's there currently. Um, any thoughts on that? Oh, I think it's it's profound, and and it's uh, but it's people look at, at at real estate as kind of a standalone uh, industry, and it's you know way well overbuilt uh, from a reported sixty five million. Uh, or more empty housing units in China, et cetera, et cetera, heavily indebted. But what 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 people may not fully appreciate is the connection between the real estate industry and the, and the municipalities. Uh, often the cities uh, generate their the prime income from the real estate real estate sector. They either take a percentage equity in these companies or they charge exorbitant fees to free up land and so on. The municipal governments, which own chunks of virtually every medium and large company in China today, uh, those municipal governments are essentially throughout China, with a few exceptions, bankrupt. And so the failure of the real estate industry is going to fit, is, is going to help drag these municipal governments down. And with that, uh, many of the uh, enterprise China companies are dependent to a degree on municipal government provincial government, their largesse in funding their expansion and so on, encouraging economic uh, growth. It's a domino problem, real estate uh, sector in China. A and uh, I, I, there's not an easy solution uh, in China. The, the solution is for the, for the CCP to pump money into these companies, which creates a whole, a whole slew of other problems as well. All right. All right. Well, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we, <laughs> for those who are still with us, there's one last question, and maybe this will be the final one. But uh, thank you, everyone, for, for getting some of these in. Uh, any advice for students of U.S.-China business um, opportunities in, the, in this geopolitical environment? Um, yeah, I, I have some thoughts on this. Um, in the last two years, I think more and more Chinese companies want to go overseas. But the challenge they have is they really need help uh, when they go outside China. Not just digital marketing. Digital marketing is just a you know, 
the the tip of iceberg. They always they always need uh, the the help, you know, from uh, accounting, uh, law. So um, I think that's a growing segment uh, for a lot of um, uh, business in the US or in other countries. So I think uh, for these uh, opportunities, uh, I think uh, the students might be uh, looking for some opportunities uh, from the Chinese companies. They might need help uh, to go overseas. That's the one thing I see uh, uh, is happening right now. Alan or Lawrence, any other thoughts? No, couldn't agree more. We we just need more. We we need more language. We need more culture. We need lots of training. Well, just a quick comment on the consumer, the Chinese consumer, um, who, if you're selling to China, is the uh, pot at the end of the rainbow. Uh, let me just do this by by way of example. Um, when you in the consumer product business, you have to spend time in retail to observe your customers interacting with your product at retail. And uh, in Shanghai, a few years ago, uh, I observed uh, a Chinese couple, husband and wife, most likely shopping. And the husband was pushing the shopping cart and the wife was selecting items from the shelves. And uh, the husband was in husband purgatory, standing there waiting for her to do the shopping. She took a gift box of chocolate and put it into the shopping cart. Uh, well, she went away to get more stuff and the husband, I could see just by his body language, picks it up, sees the price. He's shocked. He puts it back on the shelf and she returns and saw that her chocolate was missing. She stared daggers at her husband who meekly took that chocolate and put it back in the <laughs> shop. And I said to myself, yes, Chinese consumers are just like everyone else in the world when it comes to chocolate. So the moral of the story is there are a billion consumers, not all accessible, in China who want to buy and consume just like everyone else in the world. It's the, the big challenge is finding a way through all the complexities between governments and politics and what ha corruption and what have you just to get to that consumer. But there is a pot at the end of the rainbow, and that is the Chinese consumer. All right, that's a good close. Thank you, guys. Great story. Great working with you over the last few weeks on this. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who's who's been able to make it and attend. We look forward to seeing you at the next session. All the best. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Well done, Sean. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic, thank you, uh, fantastic session, Sean. I mean, it was so well orchestrated. I just had to show up and hit buttons. These guys did oh, all. Oh, he, he did a lot more than that. Good I, did, yeah, I yeah, can yeah. very well tell. Yeah. You did a lot <laughs> more than that. <laughs> Good to work with you guys. We'll talk yeah. to you later. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Bye -bye. Hello, everybody. Bye. Thank you for your time. Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Well, well done, Thunderbird. Okay. Yeah, yeah. End of the day, it's Thunderbird, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, how will any other business school uh, 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 compare? We're everywhere. Right. <laughs> yeah. Really. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye right. now. Thank you. Take care. Bye.